Earlier this week, I got to sit down with Justin Grote, the narrative designer at Theorycraft Games, working on Supervive. We had the opportunity to discuss everything from the different characters, their abilities, how they interact with the gameplay, lore, and narrative, and so much more. As always, if you like this kind of content, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me over at twitch.tv slash ohayspun. Links will be down in the description and let's just get right into it. So here we are, everyone. We've got Justin Grote here. Um, he is the senior narrative designer over at Theorycraft working on Supervive. Um, we're going to have a very casual conversation here, talk about some of the lore voice actors and everything we can kind of expect from that side of the game development. And let's get right into it. Awesome. Yeah, it's so great to be here. Like, <laughs> I think we're really excited to be able to finally talk about the world because so much of it has been in development and we didn't want to share too much information too early because, uh, you know, a lot of the game is sort of in this iteration phase where we're building on it and changing it mm -hmm. honestly pretty rapidly over time. That's one of the advantages of having kind of a small and agile team like we have. But the thing about lore is that you don't really want to do that with the lore, the world. Like you don't want to put stuff out there and then retcon it. Yeah. Because that sort of undermines the idea that that like the feeling that this is a real place. Um, so that's why we've been pretty quiet about it. But the team has been thinking about it for a long time before I even got here. Uh, because I I'm I just passed my two month, you know, anniversary on the <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It has been a crazy freaking two months. I bet. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of that push has been for uh, getting VO into the game. So getting all the mm -hmm. characters to speak and, and to say their lines. Um, and one of the things that we needed to do in order to achieve that, like to really write good scripts that are characterful and that uh, feel very distinct from character to character so that when you're playing, you know, Felix, it feels different from when you're playing Bishop. Um, we needed to actually understand like what is set in stone in the world like what is this real place um and we had similar asks from like how do how do powers work and what are powers and what's the match you know structure and all this kind of stuff so really all of our lore development to date has been uh kind of trying to support the gameplay uh and again that's mm -hmm. why we have a narrative designer and not yeah. just a pure writer is because uh i think for us like the narrative and the lore and the world building it all is invested in let's make the game as good as it can be um, absolutely yeah yeah i so think philosophically I think, yeah, I think i can tell too based off of like your past experience a lot of it's coming from like multiplayer competitive games that on the surface you wouldn't really think are big storyline games so i would assume that kind of fitting in the narrative there it's it's high in with gameplay and all of that is really an important part of it that you'd see probably more so than even like a typical like rpg or something like that what what do you think is the biggest challenge there as far as getting into a like multiplayer pvp game and creating a world and environment that fits in with the gameplay as well wow we this this one could be a whole interview on its yeah. own uh we could just talk about we this for come a back for the two hour extended <laughs> edition of the, the interview yeah but... this is this is a never-ending struggle yeah uh or challenge i guess is probably a better word because it's really fun trying to figure out how this stuff should work yeah um but i think i think that pvp games do present a very specific set of narrative design challenges um one thing is you are going to hear every single line ten thousand times yeah. you know for the most part at least when you're working in at the this kind of scale where like we get one voice session per uh character that's what we've been doing mm -hmm. um so everything you're going to hear for every character in uh, the Steam Next Fest build, and then also in open yeah. beta, we're only going to have one voice session. So we had to be really careful about like which context are we going to cover, and then we had to make sure every line we wrote was going to be like evergreen. It was going to feel awesome the 800th time you heard it. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's one thing, and that usually means you have to be very short. You have to write very short lines, but they still have to be very. Uh, like intensely colorful and characterful, even though they also are giving you very clear and important gameplay information. So I think it's sort of like almost like minimalist poetry in a way. Yeah. Uh, writing for a PvP game, and, and because you don't get you don't get the full sentences, you know, you don't get to imagine the scenes, and honestly, you don't know how it's gonna actually come into being because the story that's gonna happen, like the story of the match, is dependent on what yeah. the players do. Um. Yeah. So I think. Yeah. 
those are some of the challenges. Yeah, I, I remember uh, I, I was watching the stream with uh, Bill and Howard, and he jokingly was like yelling, get over here a few times just to, I think that's like a really good example of like a short snippet from, uh, that's Mortal Kombat, right? I'm not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's one of those really short sentences that can really, I think, thematically, the whole catchphrase is so impactful on that character that you think of, you think of that catchphrase almost before the character itself. I, so as far as those catchphrases and short snippets, you said you get one session per, how many, how many sounds do you think we can expect per hunter, I guess? So those scripts, uh, they do vary and it depends on when the actor was brought in. So, mm -hmm. Uh, we had finished about seven of the heroes. Oh, sorry. We had finished about seven of the hunters uh, mm -hmm. before I, I joined. Champions, and hunters. So, yeah, I get a yeah, mixed yeah, up we, myself. We, we, <laughs> I think a lot of the time it's it's like the industry standard word is hero. So that's what yeah. everybody says internally. Um, but yeah, so our hunters, we had mm. seven of them recorded when I arrived. And then we, uh, in the last, over the last two months, pretty much pretty front loaded, uh, we did the remaining nine and then we did the announcer. So um, we, I think the, most of the scripts are about 300 lines long. Oh, wow. uh, and the way those sessions would work is they'd be four hours uh, and we kind of go one line at a time and we'll get two takes from the actor. Sometimes one of those is great. We'll just grab it right away. Cool. Um, other times there might be a little adjustment uh, where we're like, you know, like that doesn't quite fit the context or, you know, this, uh, this is a really action packed moment. Uh, so it needs to be a little more projected or maybe the other way where it's like, well, now the character sounds like they're panicking, but these yeah. are really <laughs> bad characters and, yeah. you know, death in the game doesn't mean the same thing it does in other games. So uh, we, uh, we had to, I think, push a lot on being like kind of cool and calm and, and uh, determined. We'll talk about, I think the, like what our hunters are in the world a little later, yeah. but they're people who like they're they they are born to live in this crazy environment. They are exceptional. They are yeah. like full of determination. So we had to make sure that that came through in, in the lines. But anyway, so we do that. And we go through all 300 lines, and honestly, that would take us right to the four hour mark in almost wow. every case. And in some cases, we couldn't even get through everything because it's just that that's how challenging it is. Um, how, how many different iterations I'd say for each ability are there? Like if, if I'm playing Kingpin and he goes out to grab a, another hunter, is he going to be yelling the same exact thing at me every single time we do that? Or are we going to have a lot more variation? I would assume too, with abilities that are used yeah. more frequently on shorter cooldowns, we probably have maybe more yeah. options with that. But so I think when we did the script, we didn't know exactly how that was going to work. So we over recorded, uh -huh. we get made sure we had extra options. Um, Great. And we had some hypotheses, uh, and honestly, we've gone back and forth, and we've played with it. And this is an area where the game is still very much going to be yeah. uh, refined over time, because once we have the files, there's the question of hooking them all up. Um, so for that question of like, what does somebody say when they throw an ability? You know, there's one perspective that says uh, VO should be a tell, like mm -hmm. a, a gameplay tell that always gives you this very reliable information. Um, the same way a sound effect does or a UI pop-up or anything else like that. Or maybe some like a visual effect that shows the outline of the ability. Like VO, there's one way of thinking about VO, which is that it's very similar to that. And that line of thinking would lead you to say, okay, these lines always need to say the same thing so that players know that's what it's associated with. Um, and that's what we do, for instance, with ultimate abilities, because they're really important. Yeah. So every time you you do an ultimate ability, you and your team will hear one line, uh, and the enemies will hear a different line. And that way you can distinguish between, is it my friendly Felix who's ulting, or is it the enemy Felix who's yeah. ulting? But for the other abilities, where we kind of landed with those is that for the most part, they're not so critical, like in terms of the, the VO, to like tell what's going on. And they happen so frequently because our game is very fast paced and the cooldowns yeah. are very short. Um, so we ended up kind of building this system that it will try to find line. It basically it'll, it'll fill space with lines. So your characters will always be speaking a certain amount, but there's some cooldown tracking. We have something called a global cooldown. Yep. Um, and we have a lot of like careful broadcast settings. Played plenty of MMOs. Eh? I'm, I'm very familiar yeah. with the GCD. <laughs> yeah. So we have, we have a bunch of that kind of stuff, uh, that we've been tinkering with. And the hope is that when you play a character, you really feel the presence of that character. Okay. And you also feel some presence from your ally, and you feel the presence from your enemies. 
but it's not so much that it gets spammy. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and the, and uh, as I guess part of your question was also about the variety. And I think we've tried to just maximize variety um, as much as we can across the board. But I, at the end of the day, like it's going to be like maybe there's three or four yeah. lines for when Kingpin throws if, his hook. If you're Although one actually, tricking a character, a... you might have mm -hmm. you might get very good at the uh, the voice acting of it yourself, probably. Yeah, <clears throat> I think so. And we, I mean, we hope that we write stuff that can be iconic and that players will like so much that they'll want to quote it to yeah. each other and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, I got about five more questions just from listening to other things you talked about there as far as the hunters not being afraid of dying and all of that stuff. So I guess maybe we should step away from the voice acting a little bit and let's talk a little bit more about the world itself. Um, I know you Absolutely. have publicly talked about what a super vibe is, what the namesake of the game is. Um, but for those of us who aren't stalking the voice actors, Twitch channels, um, <laughs> How would you describe the super vibe? How, how, I guess, does it directly impact gameplay? Yeah. So I think before I can answer that question, it's probably helpful to just zoom out and talk yeah. about the world as a whole because, um, yeah, there's some there's some there's some underlying stuff about like what is this planet and what mm. happened here that informs the answer to that question. So basically, uh, our game is set in a fantasy universe on a fantasy planet uh and it's sort of like middle earth if twenty five thousand years had passed that's one of the mm -hmm. ways our creative director okay. or okay. our art director josh talks I'll about quote, it. i'll quote so, you guys on that yep <laughs> yeah so it's a world that has magic the mm -hmm. planet in fact itself is magical and that's where everyone's magic comes from um and but it's also a world that is very advanced technologically and socially uh, the whole world has been explored. Um, it's it's in in some ways it resembles like our modern world today. In some ways they're more advanced, and obviously they have magic and a lot of their technology. Mm -hmm. um, but in other ways, maybe they haven't figured out quite all the technologies that we have uh, on actual Earth. Um, so that was the setting maybe 13 years ago in the within the universe. So 13 years before the game is set. It's a golden age, a technological golden age. You know, it's it's a peaceful world. It's a it's a it's kind of a beautiful place to live. Like you can have a safe, wonderful life no matter where you are. There's still problems uh, in the world, but for the most part, like it's stable. There's not a lot of war. Um, it, very advanced technology, as I said. Um, and then there's sort of this disaster that strikes, and the disaster is these huge monsters called abyssals uh, sort of emerge from beneath the earth and they start to destroy everything. And it's totally unclear what they want. Mm -hmm. um, and it's unclear what can be done to stop them. You know, the world's militaries are all defeated. They try a bunch of crazy uh, strategies to, to fight these things off. Nothing works. And so the abyssals are just spreading across the land and destroying cities. And it's 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 a horrible, horrible situation. It's kind of maybe a little bit like Pacific Rim if the okay. uh, if the folks in the giant mechs were not around or yeah. were unsuccessful, <laughs> you know. So the 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 abyssals are winning. Yeah. Um and it looks like all is lost. And then at that last kind of moment, there's a there's this desperate act, which um is called the rising. And what happens there is many of the most powerful magic users on this planet kind of combine their their magic uh, to lift as much of the planet's uh, land masses into the world as they can. And I, I don't know how much that is. Maybe it's like half the land mass they're able to lift. Um, a lot of the details about this are kind of mysterious. Like the average person wouldn't even know this the specifics. They would mm -hmm. know that this happened, obviously. Um, but like exactly who was involved. There's lots of rumors about that. We'll talk about why we've designed it that way uh, maybe in a little bit because mm -hmm. we do want the, yeah. the world to have all these layers and to feel very mysterious. Um, but yeah, so that's what leads to the world the game actually takes place in. So th it's set 10 years after the rising. And uh, now all life on this planet is basically spread across these sky islands that we call the sky realms. And this aerial world is where uh, it's sort of like it's a it's a post apocalypse, but it's bright. You know, uh, there are still beautiful places up there that are worth protecting. There's people who are heroes, 
There's also people who are not so heroic. And there's a big open question, which is what kind of form will the world take in the future? Like, will it be possible to reclaim the planet down below from those abyssals at some point? Or is it possible to like build a new and better civilization up in, in the sky? Like, those are the kinds of questions that I think are animating our hunters at the, uh, at the time the game is set. Wow. I, okay. Yeah. That's, that's, I mean, that's, that's even more than I, I had already, already known. That's, that's a lot to take in. Um, and, and I can see even, I, I can see just hearing you talk about it. There's definitely a lot of passion behind it. And I can also see just, there's so many options and directions for this to go. Um, it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun to <laughs> see where that goes. Um, and, and it's something I think you can play out seasonally, potentially. Um, mm-hmm. Um, I guess I could ask that too. Then is is your plan to continue the storyline over seasons, or is that I mean obviously it probably would change over time, but do you think do you think it would be like a seasonal thing, or are we gonna get more of a consistent stream of lore? We're still figuring we're still figuring out a lot of what we want to do with the seasons, mm-hmm. but I think there is a major desire to kind of like push the world forward and explore more of it and yeah and move the story forward and um i think to what we've done so far is aimed mostly at creating a very rich palette for Mm -hmm. the designers and artists uh and you know me as a narrative designer like creating something where we can create many different kinds of characters out of that material where we can imagine many different uh places or uh groups of people or or factions or uh enemies all kinds of like stuff that could be in this world we want it to feel like a world where anything is possible where like it can really pull players in yeah. and, and get them excited and we want all our characters to feel like like we want to be able to come out with a new character and it's like well this character has a crazy backstory you never thought of before um so i think we're very focused on setting the stage for all that right now. Yeah. And as far as how we're going to execute on it in the longer term, I think that honestly is going to depend to a certain extent on like, how does the game do? Um, and how, for sure, what yeah. do our seasons look like and what do players respond to? Awesome. That's yeah. I, I think given the kind of a, I don't want to call it a blank slate, but a, a kind of open world like that, it does really give a lot of options for like what you introduce in the future and having it not, Retconning is always an issue, I feel like, with storylines, especially when it comes to games that are being told over years and sometimes decades. So I think really getting that foundation in the beginning is super important, and I, I it really sounds cool. Um, so we've got a, kind of an idea of the world, um, what happened to the world. It's, it's neon apocalyptic, I believe, is what it's been called. Um, what is a Vive? Ah, okay. So I told you the planet is magic yes. and the core of the planet. And basically, if you go underground, you'll find reserves of magic that can actually be tapped. Um, and that's just co- that's common knowledge that mm-hmm. everybody in the world was aware of. That that was fueling a lot of uh, we call it fey tech. So there are uh, there are beings on this planet. There's people living on this planet who are not human. They are called fey. Yep. And they are very long lived. They they live for hundreds or or maybe even thousands of years, um, and they are um, uh, overwhelmingly the the main users of magic on the planet. So they are attuned to magic. And there may have been other times in history when this was different, but for the most time, for the most part, in in our world around the time it's set, like humans don't have magic. Only the Fey have have magic. Okay. And so they've been basically channeling. And almost like digging and extracting magic out of out of the the planet's crust, um, and that form of magic we basically call vive. Uh, so mm-hmm. vive, which well, every time I say it, I'm like, am yeah. I actually <laughs> saying? Am I enunciating precisely enough? Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you go down onto the map in the actual match, what you are uh, collecting in terms of power, your experience. Uh, you know, even the vive beans like that heal you, all of that is magic that's leaking out of this sort of like planet's uh, shattered uh, remains. Because yeah. when when the rising happened and those islands were lifted up, that basically put all these huge holes in the planet's crust. And now it's like yeah. kind of a half destroyed mess down there that's still crawling with monsters. 
and the the remains of the planet are leaking magic that's actually like it's kind of venting into space um okay. which by the way another another thing that's fun is that the moon got blown up <laughs> oh no <laughs> uh but anyway <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you have uh, 20 probably hundreds and hundreds of random little facts like that that it's very interesting. We've been accumulating them. Yeah. I bet you can put those on like uh like load screens or something. Just yeah. get little little random lore facts in there it would be really cool. But we've snuck some flavor text into the game. It's yeah. on uh there's some on some abilities, some hunter abilities, and also some on some powers. Okay. Um so we're starting to we're starting to experiment with ways to get little snippets uh into the game. Cool. But anyway, so Vive is magic from the planet. Uh -huh. And a super vibe is kind of like a meteorological convergence where a mm -hmm. lot of that magic is released all at once. Okay. Um, and it's almost like a like a solar flare or something, this huge burst of magic. Um, and what's cool about that is that if you're there when it happens, you uh, could actually absorb some of that and and take some of that power for yourself. And then you could use that to uh, achieve whatever was important to you maybe you want to make a certain place more beautiful maybe you want to rule the world like mm -hmm. all those sort of motivations um are reasonable uh and we have hunters who have all kinds of different motivations but the thing they're all chasing is they want to survive to the end of the match so they can absorb that super vibe and like become uh infused with all of that power okay very cool the lighthouse the lighthouse we're all hanging out on the lighthouse That's i actually right. i i heard there might canonically be a gym on the lighthouse that <laughs> certain two characters go to frequently um mm -hmm. so the lighthouse is uh it's sort of an off-screen place but it is pretty important yeah. in our lore and it is where all of the hunters hang out when they're about to go hunt one of these super vibes and so they're not there all the time it's not like they live there um because the thing about super vibes is that in the actual world they're kind of rare it might be every few months so our okay. characters are all do they're all off in the sky realms doing all kinds of things you know bishop is fighting pirates and uh, a bunch of our other characters are busy protecting a place called haven shard which is a beautiful place um that's kind of like mm. fragile and it's it, it exists as it's it's like the there are different factions and it's in their best interest that this place remains safe. Um, but it's all kind of fragile and based on negotiation. Um, yeah. So some of our characters, Very which cool. we're calling this group, the Haven guard, they have volunteered to uh, basically protect this place. Um, those include Shrike and uh, Aluna and Zeph and, and Oath. And uh, I think myth is the other one we have flagged for that. So, so those okay. folks, you know, I guess the reason I bring that up is just because, uh, off screen, off, when they're not on the match fighting for stuff, uh, our hunters have all kinds of things that they care about and they're working toward. But when it, when, you know, when it is detected, oh, the super vibe is going to take place here, then the lighthouse moves there and it can carry the hunters with it. Uh, and they all have, uh, through some kind of procedure, I guess I should explain what it is. It is an ancient ship that is poorly understood. It's so I, I mentioned that the planet has like 25,000 years of history. Okay. Well, this particular ship is from some long lost era and it was buried underground. Um, and it has basically been freed or released uh, during the rising. And now for reasons that are kind of mysterious, it is, uh, it is going around to these different super vibe locations. Um, and it's been discovered that you can anchor yourself to it and what, what that's like a magical process. And once you've anchored yourself to the lighthouse, uh, you're actually, you can't die. Like if you're, if you go down to the map and you, uh, you know, are crushed by a mm -hmm. giant monster's foot or whatever, you just are sort of resummoned right back on the lighthouse. Okay. Um, so it's like your your soul is kind of tethered to this ship. So that's our explanation for why you respawn in the game. Uh, and gotcha. the respawn beacons are probably also from whatever civilization built the lighthouse. Um, I noticed they, they did seem to have like a very similar, I guess, architecture to the very small picture that we have of the lighthouse that I've, I've tried to zoom in on. But they they did seem quite similar that in the uh, the drop pods as well. 
they seemed so those i guess are all probably coming from the same ancient technology then yeah i think so i think the drop pods it may be a little more of a mixture so what we're thinking is that the lighthouse has sort of a bay at the bottom and there's smaller ships that the actual hunters will leave on and then those they will take the drop pods off of those but um yeah so there's probably all kinds of stuff on the lighthouse it's really large um they might have some of the characters might have brought equipment to make a gym (laughs) there or maybe there was some some ancient kind of material there there's definitely all sorts of stuff there one of the other things that's on the lighthouse is um there is a consciousness kind of uh like embedded in uh the structures and the uh i mean honestly i think about it kind of as like crystals that's probably a very basic Mm -hmm. uh probably a it's underselling probably the complexity of the technology there but um there's a consciousness that is kind of speaking for the lighthouse and maybe maybe even piloting it or certainly uh kind of acting as its overseer and that is our announcer okay so our announcer is actually the voice of someone's like i don't know if it was like an ai or like a person who somehow got trapped in these crystals um it's a Uh, little mysterious there but they are basically uh overlooking each of these events and kind of uh watching watching from above okay i i really appreciate a good like lore tie-in with the actual like game mechanics and even like ui elements sometimes you can do that and it's really kind of like a fun uh it's i think what makes games so amazing is just the different mixture of different uh backgrounds and mediums that you get to kind of have them all connect and create this like just perfect thing you did say crystals though and feel free to not answer but i did see a teaser of a new hunter today that has crystals floating all around her um and grenades crystal grenades i saw as well is there a connection there (laughs) um I can't I can't speak too much about that character yet. Uh-huh. Um but we I am very excited about her. Uh and we are actively working on all sorts of stuff. I don't think there's going to be too much of a connection with the with the announcer character in the lighthouse. Okay. Um my thinking on that character is that she is uh she is from this same kind of era and and has a, a little bit of a similar backstory to many of our other hunters. Mm-hmm. Um the younger hunters if you think about it uh they were only 10 or 12 when this apocalypse happened. So, mo- yeah. you know, they've grown up mostly in this post-apocalyptic world. When um, you say younger hunters, are we, we're talking about Zeph. Is there another Zeph one that's is actually, is, well, Zeph, I, I remember hearing something about him being actually immortal. He's visually younger, right? Yeah. Zeph is a little older than he looks because he's a fae. He's fae. So, yeah. Let me see what I wrote down for Cause so have, I did, a, I did some calculations. Have the fae. I know this. ghost is half fae yeah um so, so i think ca- i'm I think trying to think of the younger i guess if you were you know in your 20s early 20s you'd, you that would that would check out so we do mm-hmm. they would still be adults we don't have any like younger younger characters i guess quite yet well the other thing is <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> yeah so, so for instance Jin uh stalker he's on the younger yeah. side uh same with jewel uh, shrike i think we have her at like I want to say mid twenties, but just let me double check. Yeah, yeah, mid twenties. Uh, so there's definitely some characters who are a little bit uh, younger because I think uh, those. W- what we like about that idea is that for some people, uh, life in the sky realms, you know, they they they're growing up in it and they are embracing it and mm-hmm. they're making the most of it, even though it's chaotic, even though it's dangerous. They are determined to have a good time. So another character I would really call out on that front is Bishop, okay. uh, who's also on the younger side. Uh, yeah, so they they bring a lot of energy. Um, yeah, but yeah, one more one one of the things about ages is that we have different sort of like it's a fantasy world, so we have different species. There are uh, we like foxkin, like like Felix. So Felix is actually I think only thirteen, um, but the thing is that in fox years. That's, you know, <laughs> mid thirties. Okay. So you can kind of imagine that for him, he was only three when the rising happened. So basically he never knew a world prior to this. And he, grew I, I up haven't heard his voice acting yet, but I, I would assume that he's still a bit immature though, or, or just crazy. Um, 
Uh, he's yeah, he's crazy. I, <laughs> he's crazy. The voice right? actor, for, the voice actor for him did an amazing job because I think I think where we wanted to go with him, where we want to go with him, he's definitely a pyromaniac. He yeah. loves setting things on fire, um, but he wants to be a hero. You okay. know, that's the thing about him is that he wants to be a hero. He was sort of uh, cast out of his uh, community because. Um, I guess I, I can just tell you tell you this the whole story of Felix. Maybe this is yeah, yeah. an evocative example For, of one uh, of our hunters. Yeah, I will not stop you. <laughs> Please. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so uh so Felix, you know, he is a bright flame fox. That's the name of his sort of community, the bright flame foxes. Mm -hmm. 95% of bright flame foxes. Uh, and by the way, these all like animal based peoples in our world, we call them wildlings. Okay. Um and so there's there's probably various kinds of wildlings, but Felix was a fox and he lived with with uh, many other foxes. Uh, and it was very common to develop fire powers, uh, basically the ability to generate and control fire uh, in this community of, of wildlings. But the thing is that Felix never developed that. Mm. He was kind of one of the rare people who who didn't get that. And so, and that was obviously, that was very crushing to him and everyone made fun of him for it. And it, he felt like people looked down on him. He was still, he was very smart. He was very determined, you know, but like, but he just couldn't, he didn't have that magic in him. Um, so I think he, he, as a young foxkin, he was like very distraught about that. And he would go on these long wandering journeys through this, this big forested sky island that he lived on. And one day he kind of found uh, a friend and that he, he basically met or came across this flame spirit named Embry. And they Embry. sort of, uh, which, well, he named him Embry. I don't okay. think the flame spirit actually <laughs> speaks, yeah. um, but it's sort of like an elemental manifestation of some of that magic that's leaking out of the planet. Um, and friendly little guy and they sort of hit it off and they became buddies. Um, and uh, like I said, Felix was very smart. So what he did was he invented a bunch of things, devices that would allow him to kind of approximate the fire powers that he would have uh, sort of uh, obtained naturally if he was one of the lucky 95%. Um, and in fact, he was even able to build some stuff that was so like well crafted and that was so you know powered by this flame spirits and like kind of distilled magical might. Um, that he actually could exceed what other people in his village could do. And he was really proud of this and excited about it. So finally he gets ready to show off his inventions and he goes to his, you know, he's, he, he shows everybody in his village what he can do. But unfortunately in the process of demonstrating that he kind of burns down the whole village Oh, and everyone's incredibly mad at him. And they're like, why did you do all this? And they exile him. So that's, the beginning of his journey which has probably been going for a few years when the game is set okay. where he's been sort of cast out of this community uh but he still has this urge to prove himself like that he is actually good they were wrong about him you know and that he can you know his powers are really sweet actually and that everyone should say he's super awesome and thank <laughs> him so that's kind of his yeah. set of motivations and that's what drew him to chase these super vibes because he wants the glory yeah. You know, and maybe those reasons he wants the glory can be a little selfish. Maybe the reasons he wants to be regarded as a hero are a little selfish, but he definitely has good intentions, right? He's not he's not trying to hurt people necessarily. He's not he doesn't get like joy out of like sadistically. He's not a villain at all, but he yeah. does cause all kinds of chaos because he's impulsive. He's reckless and he is to a certain extent kind of selfish. So kind of. Yeah. Complex, I guess, is probably a good way to. He's not just a simple pyromaniac. He's he does have motivation there. I actually, I just just thinking about his motivation for being a part of the super vibes. It's very interesting to kind of at least head cannon. I don't think we have time for it today, but kind of think of all of the different hunters that we have at least in the initial lineup and what their motivations might be for going in and trying to absorb that magic power that's coming from these super vibes. So that's really cool. Totally. Are you um, curious about any? Is there anyone oh, I can give you some? I, I, info I, well, I'm curious about what I will, I guess, call the uh, wildling now, right? Uh, the Luna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm curious a little bit about her. I don't think we've heard much. She seems very mysterious. And I think even just the power of harnessing like 
lunar stuff, especially now that we know that the moon is exploded. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'd be curious to hear a little bit about her. Sure. Yeah, so basically... Uh, the planet is magic, like I said, and it's yeah. the source of base of most people's magic. But another thing in the world that is magic is actually the moon. And that is uh, astronomically speaking, because the moon of this planet, just like our planet, was originally part of the planet. So it got mm. it's a chunk that got knocked off by some okay, yeah. collision in the early solar system. So the, the moon is magic and uh, Luna's people basically worshipped it sort of as a god. And it may even have been a god, although it was the mysterious kind that maybe didn't speak to you directly and was a little it's unclear i think um many people believe that it doesn't have a consciousness but many people do um so for aluna's people uh they would kind of attune to the moon and they would be able to draw on it and and use its power to heal people and and all kinds of stuff so she was training to kind of become a uh, a moon priestess in her community and like many of the other characters, uh, at that moment of the rising, uh, there was this cataclysm because the ground starts to break apart and all this energy is being released. You know, maybe there's lava coming up out of the ground um, and horrible earthquakes and all this stuff as the, as the land is torn apart and starts to rise up into the sky. Um, and so many people in Aluna's village were killed, including her. Mm. Uh, and so she actually died. Uh, maybe she was trying to save some people. Uh, I think that's the way I'm thinking about it, is that she's she's trying yeah. to save some people in a building that collapses on her. Um, and she had obviously taken all these oaths to help people and protect people and save people. Um, but she she's killed. But then this mysterious thing happens, which is at the same time that that magic power from the rising is being released, it uh, it shatters the moon on its way out. Uh, oh. Sort of like kind of imagine this big burst of of energy that's released uh, in the process of lifting all these uh, islands, and the moon is shattered. And sort of at that moment, it I, like something happens. There's some mysterious magical surge from the moon, uh, and as part of that, and there may have been all kinds of other strange effects around the world, uh, but one small effect of that is that Aluna was actually brought back to life. Uh, and she was granted, you know, much stronger lunar powers than anybody had ever had before, um, such that she can actually bring other people back to life under certain circumstances. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I think she feels like her mission, she's basically been confirmed that her goals and her mission to protect people and save people and, and you know, minimize suffering in the world, like a very sort of um, selfless mission, she feels like, she has been given confirmation that that's what she's supposed to do. So she is pursuing it with, I think, a uh, great intensity of belief. Um, and she's found, you know, so many of these characters kind of wandered the sky realms for a while, trying to find a place that felt like home again after mm. after the rising. And the place she found is called Haven Shard, and it's a beautiful place. Um, and so she's kind of signed on to help protect it and preserve it. Um, yeah, and I think that are, those are her motivations. Cool. Wow. Yeah, it's just endless. Um, so we we could probably talk about all of them. I would love to have every single introduction to all of the uh, hunters <laughs> right right here right now. But obviously, I think you guys are going to probably do something a little more. I don't want to say professional, but more maybe cinematic with that. What what do you guys plan on doing with the storyline to introduce people in? I guess more of a direct way do you guys do you guys want to do i mean obviously if i i'm guessing you'd love to do comics and cinematics and you know bobbleheads and little little figurines and everything you could do but currently i guess right now as we get closer and closer to what looks to be an open beta this year and i mean fingers crossed can't confirm anything but i would love to see a launch next year um where do you think you're going to be going with that at least in the next more near nearer future yeah, I've, we've talked about a lot of things, but the truth is the team is just, uh, you know, we're a very small team yeah. and we are uh, very focused on our mission of reaching as many players as possible and uh, building a game that can really last for years. You know, like my goal is 
to work on this team for like 10 years. They're yeah. gonna, they're not like, <laughs> I'm ride or die for this yep. game. So. <laughs> I, I, think, I think a lot of us are, and, and we're not even working on it. So I, I, I think there's, there's, I there's, love it. There's people, people we've, I don't know. We do, there's something about Supervive and I, I mean, I've been calling it Project Loki for way longer than that. I, I've been around for coming on almost two years now. Um, and it, there's something magical there. And I think it's one of the reasons why I've really caught on to what was a, I would say a complete lack of lore, but there you could, mm. you could just feel in the characters, they felt so alive. And there was, I, 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 I had stories in my head of every single one of them for, for the longest time. So I, I think, yeah, getting this into as many people's hands as possible is, is definitely the play. Um, and I would love to see where it goes. Um, it sounds really cool. Is there anything you wanted to talk about specifically that we could go into? Not too much. I mean, I do think like right now, the thing that we are talking about more than anything else is like, we just want people to wish list the game. We got to get the word out. I wish I could figure out exactly which lore would be most likely to make a <laughs> yeah. hypothetical viewer subscribe, you know, yeah. go to like subscribe <laughs> to Oh Hey Spun, like go to yep. theme and then click the wish list button and then play October 14th. Like it's crazy how hard the team is working, how yeah. devoted we all are, like the amount of attention to detail that people are giving stuff. Like we're just getting started and we, just want to make something awesome we can work on for years you know so um and it's so like the reason i believe so much in the possibility of us really sticking around and building something lasting that we get to explore all these questions and really show the world and maybe we can do cinematic someday you know and all the crazy stuff that could be possible if we yeah. achieve our goals it's because of people like you who are into the game who have been around and like who who've stuck in with the community and and who are like enjoying the game and asking like when is the next playtest like i wish it was up yeah. right now like that's the, why we're pushing the, so hard the monthly to get dread it out. of waiting for the next playtest so i i think we a, want a lot yeah. of people can relate to that um yeah i mean hey i i think everyone any any of the content creators i've spoken to we always say like oh no it's because of the passion of the dev team and then the dev team they want to shoot it back at us and it's 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 this back and forth ping pong of it i mean at the end of the day you guys are creating something i think that's just super special super exciting and the just getting even what i would say is the top of the iceberg as far as the lore and narrative is super exciting just just even hearing it and it it it, it kind of backs up what i initially thought already about the lore and it's it's going places that i think are going to be really exciting to watch in the future oh man i'm happy to hear that i'm happy nice yeah Success. mission accomplished <laughs> <laughs> awesome thank you everyone for watching um hopefully we can do more of this stuff in the future it's been fun and i'll see you guys in the next one later